You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Hertz here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are beginning a new book. Solari Gentil's Ned Kelly award-winning Crossing the Lines. We are discussing chapters one to eight, that is on introductions to a necessary violence. And I am in the hot seat today. Herds, I am so excited for this book. I am excited too. This has been a fascinating ride, an exhilarating ride reading this book on my end. And just, I cannot tell you how excited I am to hear your thoughts and your theories going forward, folks. Now, I had to tell you about this book, of course. Uh, the protagonist of this story is a character by the name of Edward McGinnity. His friends call him Ned. He's 28. He's a rich boy, uh, but he lost his parents when he was young and in, in a, a car accident, he, like trying to go over a bridge and it collapsed under him. But uh, in the, in the, you know, the, the blowback, the, the aftershake as it were uh, of the incident, he became very rich from, from his lawyers, his fancy lawyer friends, uh, and and future going forward. He's become a writer in the interim uh, since spending some time at the, the old orphanage and now is, well, he's a writer, but he's also a lover, I would say. Uh, <laughs> he has a, a lady friend by the name of Willow, who is an artiste, uh, and she is currently being suspected for the murder of a, a gentleman. But maybe we'll get more about that in a second. Anyway, that's that's the book that we're covering today. That's right. But also uh, in the book we're uh-oh. covering today, What's we this? have a, a, second, a second protagonist, oh. Madeline de Leon, who is a lawyer, uh, who just also happens to be an author living in a small town with her doctor husband. And uh, she's writing a crime novel. Mm, it's interesting how many writers and lawyers are important in this That's story. right. And the, the main character of Madeline's book is, of course- uh, Edward McGinnity. Oh, that's funny because Edward is also writing a story and the main character of his book is a literary writer. He doesn't write crime fiction because that's just very blase. Uh, he's writing a, a literary uh, fiction book about a character by the name of, of Madeline, uh, who is, you know, she's got some troubles. She's got some love troubles. She's got some some inability to have children, apparently. There's a lot of drama going on. <laughs> there is. But no crime because we just don't do crime writing. That's, yeah, that's right. That's how Ned sees things. Yeah, I guess we should jump right into that because the entire <laughs> plot of this book yeah. is essentially that these two authors are writing each other. Yeah, it's so much fun reading a book that doesn't hold anything back, doesn't really hold secret cards or anything. Like, it's a murder mystery, but even from the outset, it's pretty, uh, well, I mean, one side's a murder mystery, you know, because Madeline is, like, writing this crime book. But even from the outset, she's she's discovering Edward's character, just as Edward is discovering hers. Yeah. And so it never feels like, like Solari Gentil, the author of this, but the lovely author is, is holding secrets from us. It feels like a very natural story, which I love. I think the thing that's very good about the introduction to this book, and at least up to where we are so far, is that even though all of the action is with Edward and his side of the story, mm-hmm. I feel like the momentum through both parts of the story through Madeline and Ed's is, or Madeline and Ned's rather, yes. is uh, is really good. You know, even though Madeline's just going and visiting her parents and telling her husband about what's happening with her latest manuscript, there's still so much energy to it because of, of, of something I wanted to start this episode by talking about. Oh, sure. Always. And that is, I think Solari Gentle has finally unveiled to me uh-huh. my favorite thing in writing ever your favorite thing objectively ever well i i was reading this book herds finally we've cracked it and i was thinking to myself my goodness i love how at sea i feel how all over the place it is how we jump with absolutely no warning from edward to madeline it's barely even a jump it's more like a step yeah like you'll you'll realize halfway through a page that we're suddenly looking from the other author's perspective if you have lapsed in focus in the slightest you will be completely lost and i've realized that all of my favorite books i've ever read are exactly like this they have no peace to give you in terms of what perspective you're looking from you are thrown to the whims of the sharks that are the author's perspectives can i tell you though i completely agree with everything you're saying i'm this is more of an addition than a anything else i have realized that because the novel doesn't give you time to rest to have peace with all these sudden transitions and the escalating events that occur on both sides of the coin both sides of the story I have not found myself lapsing in concentration, which is something that I typically do like quite frequently when I'm reading a book. Even my favorite books, I'll be like, well, I just flipped three pages and I didn't intake any of it, better go back. (laughs) I not even once had that issue with this book. So clearly 
clearly she's doing something right there. It forces you to engage in with the text in a way that is enjoyable. And that is far and away the best thing about it because it takes up until chapter seven for Madeline and Edward to have a direct interaction. And that moment where we're talking about Madeline's heritage, her family being from Sri Lanka, uh, and uh, Madeline and Edward have a snide remark to one another. I, I like, you know, physically like moved my arms around. I was so excited that we'd gotten to this moment in the book because it was so clearly on the horizon. And that final delivery was so satisfying because of all of the pages I'd been taking in every single word to see when that moment would finally happen. And it just, it hit home so well. Yeah, and it happens so like carefully and quickly as well. It doesn't feel like completely blindsided or anything. And it opens the floodgates for, as we'll go through the novel, you know, we're only in the th first third right now, almost exactly one third. Uh, but, you know, as we go through the novel, we'll start to see that barrier like break down and become, uh, you know, m less noticeable, that barrier, you know, as we kind of go through the story. And yeah, I, I don't know. I, I love this book, um, not just because of how, how excellently employs these different like tropes and well, we should talk about tropes actually, but well, one of the things that it, that it does quite well is even for readers who are not familiar with all of the intricacies of these sorts of stories, um, the, the authors will frequently take themselves aside to congratulate themselves on having slipped in some facsimile of their own lives into the other person's story. Um, if there's, a, there's a character called Leith who is in both stories and occupies a similar role of like a sidekick character. Yeah, she's the literary agent for both writers, but she's yeah. just this can-do person. Yes. She's she's one of the most, I mean, fittingly as the like rock of both characters' lives, she is the most constant character between both iterations. But you can see there are all sorts of characters who uh, sort of flow between those lines. There's one very small thing uh, where Leith uh, actually, as she comments to, to Madeline, I believe, that uh, she she like had a patient who like smelled really bad, and then if you go into uh, into into Edward's world, there's a character who wears far too much perfume, and it's clear even though the authors don't call that out in that specific instance that it's the same thing being done. We're carrying the idea of a strong smell over to like depict this repulsive character and like get one back, mm. but it's also a two way street, so you got to think backwards and forwards at the same time while we're while we're introducing the rest of the cast we should talk about the mystery itself just to give I you probably, a, just to give you an appetizer we have to? <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about I'm the actual kidding. mystery itself at the end of the book but yeah. in edward's story <laughs> at the end of the book uh yep. did i say the end of the book it's okay the end of the, the oh, end of the god i'm so enraptured in this i can't Third escape part. my mind okay. cannot escape this term. i understand there's a lot anyway at the end of the show, we'll talk more explicitly about the mystery, but right now we should give you a taste that uh, Vogel, an art critic and editor who was involved with uh, Edward's love interest. Willow. Mm -hmm, yeah. uh, who was pushed down the stairs at the launch event for Willow's latest seemingly gallery. Pushed. Yeah. Seemingly pushed. And it seems that no one saw the right to do it. It's so interesting. Yeah. Uh, for for some, some additional setup here, Will Willow is set up by Madeline as the like, love interest that she's not sure that that Ned will ever actually obtain um because she doesn't like writing like actual like physical romance she just it was like beautiful the the line the line uh, and I remember it was at the bottom of a page in my edition of the book too said oh goodness then I'll have to write a sex scene exactly well, then we can't have that can we yeah. and it's just it's done the decision is made and I loved it it's it's so good how many like uh, complex details are done seemingly on a whim through the way that the story is written uh, but yeah, so Willow is is his like love interest, but she's like married. It's this whole thing, um, and so the question is, you know, who killed Vogel? Was it was it you know Willow or I mean, not Ned? Obviously, he's our protagonist. Oh, we don't not. know yet. It could we, be. Who knows? Um, Knox would you know, be happy, but you know, was it one of their like agents who wants certain money because all the art pieces have like gone up in value after Vogel's death? Was it somebody else? Is it unrelated? We don't know. And yeah, we're we're given kind of a broad mystery. Um, and to kind of, you know, tie that, the mystery itself into the, the themes of the story, uh, Madeline says that she doesn't really even know who the killer is yet. She's still exploring that in the same way that Ned is trying to figure things out. No. And I guess uh, now that we're talking about the violence, it's time to step aside and we'll be back at the end of the show uh, to talk a little bit more about the mystery in this book, how things piece together, and of course, be unable to stop ourselves from just talking more about the story because it's great so far. Well, that's okay. That's why I'm not going to say anything in the in the final part today. I'm going to let you speak of theories all day. Oh, yes. It's going to happen. We are discussing chapters one to eight of Solari Gentil's Crossing the Lines on your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we'll be back with more of that in just a second. Yeah. 
You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Hertz here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. We are discussing Solari Gentles crossing the lines. And uh, we have Solari here, but we have to start with something other than the novel, Solari, <laughs> because since we've last spoken to you, we've heard so many other shows using a soft G, gentle, for your last name. We've been using a hard G this entire time, and we didn't even realize that we were different to everyone else. Tell us, settle the debate amongst us, which is the correct pronunciation? I don't mind either. Oh, come on. You can't say that. (laughs) It's too nice of you. You can't. uh, This is like we're part of a mystery novel right now, trying to figure you out. You just won't tell us the answer. I, I, um, I tend to introduce myself as gentle because people remember it that Mm -hmm. way, uh, Mm -hmm. because it's a word, but I don't mind either. If I objected to it, you would have known about it a long time ago. Okay, that's 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 good to know. I think uh, we'll stick to our guns and be different just, just because yeah. that way we're at least consistent, even if consistently arguably wrong. <laughs> consistently wrong? Yeah, that's the important thing, isn't it? All right, fair enough. Now, at the Sydney Writers Festival this year with Candace Fox, Chris Hammer, and Tim Ayliff, you spoke about how it always feels as though Roland and your characters are standing just outside of your peripheral vision in your day-to-day life. Did figuring out a writing style for crossing the lines where you're actually putting that relationship between authors and characters on the page change Roland's position in your vision? Did you, uh, did Maddie and Ned join him as you worked on it? No, 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 not quite in, <laughs> in the sense that um, Crossing the Lines was a bit of a, it, it's a book I couldn't have written if I hadn't written the Roland Sinclair series first. If I hadn't uh, come to realise what it was to have a long-term character. So Roland's been living with me for 10 years and with each book and with each passing day, he seems to become just that little bit more real. Crossing the Lines was my way of exploring what would happen if I actually let him come out of the periphery of my vision, if I turned my head towards him without actually taking the risk of insanity by doing so. So my relationship with Roland is probably a little different Mm -hmm. to Maddie and Ned's relationship. Uh, Roland and I are more like really good friends and he thinks I'm a little odd and I can see that in his eyes when he looks at me. He thinks I'm a little odd. (laughs) (laughs) Roland then follows him around and records his life. So I don't know that we would um, plummet to the same depths that uh, Madeline and Ned eventually end up doing, but it was an (laughs) idea that I wanted to explore. Well, I I have to ask with this, you know, this deep dive, this kind of experimental text that you've produced – we, we actually see a part of Maddie's struggle um, that we're kind of exploring this opening part of the book is that she she has expectations on her from her publisher and from people she does book deals with to continue her her Veronica Kill Willie series, which is a fantastically like trite name, I want to say. I absolutely <laughs> love it. Um, was the same blowback that she receives, you know, in her, in her story, Madeline's story, is that something you were concerned about going into writing this book? Yeah, look, I, I think um, Crossing the Lines... Uh, was for me in some ways making a statement as a writer. It was is a kind of a, it was a kind of a, a statement for liberation because what happens when you're a writer is that the publishing world, not intentionally, it's not an evil plan, but they do tend to want to put you in a box and they do want to tend to identify you with a t- particular type of writing. I did have a certain amount of blowback when I said I wanted to write something that was more experimental and it was something that was greeted with a, a certain amount of trepidation uh, by the industry. Did the tune change at all when the uh, Ned Kelly Award came in? It did. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden it was, when are you writing another one like this one? <laughs> and, yeah. which, is, which is really interesting. So it is just an unfortunate fact of having a, a, a series or a, a type of book that is successful or that is loved mm. that people don't want you to risk wrecking that by doing something else. Yeah, I guess the next thing I wanted to jump into talking about, you know, wrecking things is that the writing style of this book is incredibly bewildering. The constant jumps between who is narrating and who is uh, on the page can come as incredibly blindsiding. For Herds and I, Mm. this meant the book had our full attention the entire time as the text kind of forced us to engage or be lost. But I feel that it has to be too much for some people. You know, how how much do you feel you can give your audience a literature lesson before it's gone too far? (laughs) I think, look, it, it's 
not every book is for every person and uh, Mm. certainly Crossing the Lines is a more difficult book to read uh, because Mm. you do have to pay attention otherwise you forget who's talking but I I did wanted to I, I wanted to try and give readers an idea of what it's like to be a writer you slip in and out of the consciousness of people so you know sometimes when I'm thinking I'm thinking is Roland um, or I'm thinking as one of the other characters, and then I slip into me, and then I slip back out again. Um, mm. And so I, I, I wanted to actually give readers a taste of how jumbled and chaotic a writer's mind is. Um, but I, I hope I did it in a way that is um, is discernible if you pay attention. Now, I, I notice in, in this story that in the chapter of the novel, Unnecessary Violence, we see Madeline feeling very guilty about all the violence and misery that her writing puts her protagonist net through in the course of, of, of said novel. Um, Solari, how reflective is this of your own sin and your own guilt in how much suffering you put Roland Sinclair through? Sadly, I don't feel bad at all about Roland. Oh, no. That's awful, heartless. See, the difference between (laughs) Maddie and I is that Ned did not sign up to be a crime fiction hero. He was a perfectly innocent literary writer. Roland Sinclair (laughs) signed up to be a hero. He knew what the gig entailed. Okay. (laughs) And so so I feel less guilty about it. We're in the prison. (laughs) Tortured, yeah. (laughs) That chapter was also uh, an acknowledgement of all the letters I get after every Roland Sinclair book goes out from all these concerned people who are upset at how much violence I inflict on Roland. Um, Mm. So in some ways it was an echo of concerned readers as opposed to an echo of the concern of the writer herself. Before we close out this section Uh of the discussion, because we're going to in a moment go on to full spoilers for the book and that'll be in a a later edition of the show, I right now... I'm about to pose a theory on the show. There are a heap of characters, most notably Ned and Maddie's editor, Leith. uh, And this theory I'm about to pose is that both Leiths are actually the same character and that this is one continuity as opposed to two parallel continuities, just to kind of, you know, put an idea out there. ridiculous. And I I wanted to know for you as a writer, when you're writing characters like Leith who are in both fictions and inhabit both realities, do you write them as the same character or are there differences to each Leith that we don't really get to see on the page that kind of inhabit your head? No, they're the same Leith. And in fact, Leith is a real person. She's in my life too. Leith Henry and her entire family are real people. Um, And Leith Henry has been a friend of mine since we were 12 years old, and she's the first reader of all my books. Oh, I knew I'd heard the name before somewhere. It just clicked in my head who that was. (laughs) After all these weeks. Um, So, yeah, so so while she's at my agent, she is a a psychologist by by trade. Mm. And so I was just playing with a lot of that, and it – it seemed to me that if I was going to, I needed to anchor the story with one person uh, that was common to to both their realities. And yeah. so I took a person from my reality that uh, in a way anchors me, I put her in both of theirs um, to actually make it even more meta than you thought. <laughs> oh, excellent. <laughs> it's it's such an exciting idea, this, this thought that's just recrystallized in my brain that you're using Leith to anchor the reality in the same way that most detective fictions would use a Watson to anchor to anchor a specific character who is, you know, just way too competent in the realm of, of, of mere mortals, right? You're doing the same technique, but you're using it to string parallel dimensions to each other. <laughs> like, I love that. I love that so much, Larry. <laughs> it's beautiful. I had this, uh, I had this right. sudden thought when uh, when Herds was asking me about whether there were subtle differences in the leaps because I've I've just recently finished watching the the Spider Verse with my oh, with yeah. my son. And I was thinking, oh, yeah. does he think that there's a Hispanic leaf and a, <laughs> and a Jewish leaf? Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. And an alligator leaf. I guess, uh, I guess maybe I'll have to work that into the next time, you know, when we cover the inevitable spiritual su- successor to Crossing the Lines. The mul- I'll have to work the that into somehow. Oh, no. Oh, no. All right. For those of you listening at home, this discussion is going to continue in a later episode of the show. So be sure to get subscribed to the podcast. For Solari, there's going to be no pause before the next question. We are discussing her novel, Crossing the Lines, and we'll be back with more of that in just a second. (laughs) 
You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are discussing Solari Gentil's Crossing the Lines, an award-winning novel, Herds, chapters one to eight. I am in the hot seat, and uh, poor, poor Ned McGinty, or McGinnity, McGinnity. Has, uh, McGinnity. has gotten himself into trouble. I did want to note before we continue here that yeah. in my brain, even though I've read the name correctly on the page, my my head just keeps in- inserting the pronunciation McGinty in there because I just read Adrian McGinty, but with a G. Sure, sure. Uh, so I-, I know that's wrong, but please forgive me if I continue to make that slip up because I right. inevitably will. I won't forgive you. I'm- I cannot hold that power, so, you, should, you, should you know. Pronounce- Good. You should, uh, you know, respect people's names the way that yeah. they choose to be pronounced. Um, but anyway, we're-, we're in a mystery. We're in a murder mystery right now, and you're the detective. You're, you're in the shoes of... Of Ned, our only detective. That's right. Because that's how this novel works. There is a murder mystery on one side mm-hmm. and no mysteries outside of that. Uh, so really, I know, really I- hurts. <laughs> this mystery is quite simple. Okay. Now, I want to be clear before I begin. We did an introduce a new rule on the show was during say- our last book where we have to pose a different theory in week one and two. And uh, Herds, I'm gonna I'm gonna come come right out the gate with the most obvious and most stable mystery that will like carry me through to the finish, and I can go with something a bit sillier next week. Okay, that sounds good to me. What's M- the, much what's the sillier solution? next week. What's the nice, simple, makes sense solution here? Who is the killer? The who, how, and the why, as always. As we know, according it. to SS Van Dyne, uh-huh. yep. the the murder mystery is a game between the intellect of the detective and the criminal. Uh-huh. And quite clearly, if uh-huh. we have an intellectual game between two minds in this I book, don't like Madeline where this is going. and Edward, <laughs> okay. then one of them must be the killer and the other the detective. Well, I mean, to be entirely fair, Madeline did kill Vogel. Exactly. The power it, of words. it tells us quite out front in the beginning exactly what's happened. But I think it all comes down to the scene in a necessary violence. I was going to say, I'd like to call for evidence and foreshadowing. For such a conclusion. Because, because the foreshadowing is easy, Herds. Uh-huh. The, the first pages of the book tell you that the writer did it. Like, okay, that's, sure. That's not a challenge. You know, we've had our foreshadowing. Uh-huh, sure. That's all okay. done. We can I won't, I won't s- pick this check apart that box. For now, we'll come back that's to this. Right, yeah. tell, no, me about, n- tell me about the no story problems violence. in this theory Tell me about so the necessary No issues. So we obviously have that moment we talked about earlier where Ned and Maddie both speak to each other for the first time on the page and then during a necessary violence when three quite blatantly faceless thugs uh-huh. show up to assault poor Ned. Yep. Uh, we discover quite rude of them that Maddie is standing in the doorway watching it all happen. It's true, and of course, this is presented as a third-person authorship moment where Maddie is having to consider the weight of her actions and the poor things that she's written into the page. I'm not convinced, Ben. Uh-huh. I think she's actually there in the room, and of course, Herds, as we know, overseas, this book is published as after she wrote him. So quite clearly, Madeline comes first in the timeline. The publishers are really laying the clues out there in the US. I I did want to say, um, even though this story is, you know, going to great lengths to say that, you know, both sides equal, I do feel like there is a slight slant towards towards Madeline as she is the first uh, character mentioned. But, you know, whether or not that leads into the theory, that's just, you know, oh, how slow to. chose to, to position them. There are there are no useless details in a crime book, I mean, book, that's ben. fair. That's fair. There are no pointless violences, of course. Exactly. <laughs> Everything is completely necessary. And that is the theme of this book. It's all it's all important. It all makes it all means something. OK, so my problem with this, my first problem at the gate is that we have scenes. If you are taking an interpretation of this story, whereas uh, both Madeline and Ned exist in the same space. Uh, they they have t- spoken to each other. They've like talked. Is that like is that not an admission of guilt in itself? Do do you think that they would be able to speak to each other? Like like if she's just standing there in the room and it's like I see you there. Why does he not suspect her? Well, Herds, we've spoken about this on the show before. I'm sure we have. And but remind me, please. The, the the specific thesis I'm talking about here is that when you are presented an existential question that uh-huh. poses two options, uh-huh. the answer is obviously yes. I mean, obviously, is everything. If uh, there are two writers writing each other, which one of them is real? The answer is yes. Sure. You know, that's how it works. There's magic, there's science. Which one is real? The answer is yes. So in this case, obviously the answer is yes, both authors are real, and thus by extension, with no other room for logical maneuver in this story, uh-huh. must exist in the same real physical plane below that of which Solari Gentil exists. Oh, we're talking about physical, we're talking about planes, are we now? That's right, okay. I, I thought you'd use the, uh, the iceberg levels, like you see the tip of the iceberg is Solari, and then the next bit down is... Is you know Ned and, and and Madeline, and then below that. No, no, no. You see, if we could begin talking about icebergs, it'd become very hard to hear me on the show from all the way down. I at was going to say, how, how deep do we go? 
Because it's never, it's never as big as it looks. It's always at least 100 times bigger. But really, really, Ben, I think it's quite simple. All you have to do is assume in this case that uh, Madeline has planned out her crime. She's written it ahead of time, Uh -uh. like the criminal mastermind she is. Because she lives in the country, right? And Ned's in the city. So thus they can't be in the same physical space at the same time. Oh my goodness. So Maddie has written her story, has sent the manuscript to Ned as just a friendly, you know, friend going to help a fellow author with the same literary agent to critique and edit their manuscript. So it's actually blackmail or like a threat. Exactly. So you know, going- there's lots of veiled clues in there. And what we are seeing is Ned reading through that and yeah. accidentally stumbling into the crime that Maddie has written for him. So as And as we all know, when he comes to the, the country mouse, the town mouse, it's all about the country mouse trying to kill the other guy. Exactly. Like, that is how that story goes. He pushes pushes him in front of the cat. That's right. As we know, the country folk are always the bad guys in City Stat stories. That's true. That's very true. And that's, that's why we can comfortably pin this entire crime on Madeline. She- wrote this story, sent it to Ned. Ned's reading it through. He's a little co- he's a little confused as to why it's telling about things that he's about to go and do, but he's like, all right, whatever, you know, I'll go to my friend's art gallery launch anyway. And then a death happens at the art gallery. It all gets pinned. And there's some blackmail that Maddie has on Ned. Blackmail? Probably to do with his Where's family history. Where's the blackmail coming from? It hasn't appeared in the story it yet, but been, it, it, hasn't must, been foreshadowed? it must exist. Why must it exist? It that m- sounds like garbage it, to me. It must exist because if it didn't exist, then Ned quite simply would have sent the manuscript to the police and had Maddie put Well, that's, in, that's the question, isn't it? When, when somebody sends a letter to you saying, I'm going to kill you, here is a detailed plan of how, and you ignore that, you're a damn fool. You're a damn. You're from the medieval times. You know. I, I think. I think that there's there's really quite simply, you know, no other way to. Well, I see no holes in this in this theory, and you have engaged, I think, quite convincingly with the meta textual uh, facsimiles of facsimiles. Of course, the meta, you know, yeah, the facsimiles of this of this story. Uh, <laughs> I'm going with that. I think that's a more accurate word than what I was looking for. <laughs> So <laughs> much in the same way that the, what the writers put in each other's stories is more accurate than what they're trying yeah, to say. Exactly. Right. Exactly. But uh, the point that I did want to make, no matter what happens, uh, this theory or a better theory next week. Uh, I, w- I don't think that's possible. I think I think that both of these authors are going to end up writing each other into a hole. OK. If like if uh, if I'm not correct this week and Madeline doesn't just win and get away with it all. Be pretty good. And, you know, Ed's left a rotten jail. Uh, I think that both authors are going to find out that, uh, you know, writing their co-conspirator in, into an ending from which they cannot continue to write will just mean the story is never resolved. Right. I don't think we necessarily will even find out who the physical corporeal killer of Vogel was. Oh, interesting. You don't think, do you think there even is a killer? Well, we've already been told that there isn't yet. Well, that's the question, isn't it? This will probably be true of the next two weeks as well. And I may have mentioned my note taking system on the show before, but when I e-read, I have four colors of notes that I can apply in my chosen e-reader. And I use blue for things I like, brown for things I didn't like so much, yellow for things that are, statistical clues, evidence for the crime and, you know, pink, purplish for kind of character notes and, uh, you know, clues for motive. And this is the bluest book I have in terms of my Uh, notes. Like in terms of ratio, I normally end up with a lot of pink, a little bit of yellow, a few blue and browns here and there. This book is just blue top to bottom at the moment. (laughs) It's full of so many like callbacks and call forwards and calls in between. Like there's, there's two, it's dense. It's a dense read that isn't difficult. I don't know how to explain it. Like, it's not difficult to read this book, but if you want to pick it apart, you need to go through with, like, tiny cutlery made for gnomes. It's a very comfortable book, uh, which is distinctly, uh, it is legally distinct from a cozy book, Uh, (laughs) just so that's clear. I feel like we, we call too many books cozy. This is not a cozy book. It is fraught with peril and danger, but it is a comfortable book. Uh, especially for someone who is familiar with these sort of tropes. Um, and especially as we, you know, we continue our journey through meta, you know, stories with meta components to them. Uh, this is definitely like, it's worthy of a position in that, in that library there. But that said, next week we will be covering from the chapter damage all the way to a thickening. That is chapters nine to 19. If you're following along at home, yeah, it's quite a long stretch, but think it'll be worth it i hope so i'm quite enjoying myself thank you so much for joining us here on your murder mystery world tour on 2ser 107.3 we'll be discussing those chapters next week on the show hope to see you then you're listening to 2ser 107.3 see you next time